Welcome, everybody. Um, it's really nice to have all of you here this afternoon for our inaugural event to uh, a symposium series that's on global food security and food policy. And um, we will get started. I wanted to first just welcome our speakers very briefly. Jeff Rakes, the CEO of Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and Greg Page, CEO of Cargill. And they'll get a longer introduction, more formal introduction, from President John Hennessy. I also want to thank Wally Falcon, who's sitting up there um, as a major organizer of this symposium series, and he'll moderate the event today. Um, a lot of work has gone into this, and we're really excited about the event. Before I have John come up, I just wanted to say a couple of words just to set some context. This uh, symposium series is funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and we're really grateful for their support. And in fact, it's so timely that we're talking about these issues right now. I'm sure all of you read the paper. Every single day, we're opening it up to articles on the global food situation. And as we look at prices, uh, prices are absolutely skyrocketing for the basic staple commodities right now, corn, wheat, rice, soybeans. And in fact, I think uh, wheat and corn are twice as high as they were in June in futures markets, and soy is about 50% higher. So it's just a phenomenal price spike we're seeing again on par with what we saw in 2008 when it was the major food crisis and all the riots. And so this really is an explosive time and a really good time to be talking about food policy and food security and, and what do we do about it. Obviously, a lot of this uh, price increase is also due to climate. We see these crazy climate situations, a major drought in China right now. We saw the heat wave in Russia and Ukraine this summer that knocked over the wheat markets. Australia has been flooding and cyclones, and South, South America has had huge storms as well. I mean, it's huge climate instability as well. And so everywhere you look, uh, we're seeing climate coming into the picture as well. So that's on some of the supply side, I would say. On the demand side, we may not be really paying attention to our biofuels policy in the United States, but we are certainly supporting ethanol. About 40% of our corn is going to ethanol right now, and stocks are at among their all-time lows, and that's driving the markets as well as emerging economies growing very rapidly now and demanding more meat and feed grains as well as fuel. And so all of these factors right now, just as they were in 2008, maybe even more so right now, driving a very, very precarious situation. I think, in fact, it's one of maybe the only times in history that the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times have agreed on anything in their editorial <laughs> pages, and they are doing so this week if you're reading either or both of those editorials. And what they're saying is that the world really does have a major food crisis on its hands right now, and it deserves a lot of public attention by the global community and funding and really innovative efforts to get through this. And so I think it's a great time to have two wonderful and very talented speakers uh, to help work this out for us. So I'm thankful for the series and also for President John Hennessy to lead us into this symposium. And President Hennessy, thank you. Thank you, Roz. I am delighted to be here, and I'm delighted to see this room full of so many interesting people eager to engage in this important topic. Many of you are supporters of Stanford and the program on food security and the environment, and it's a great pleasure to acknowledge your support and the importance of the work we do together. This is a significant event for Stanford. Today we launch a new series on global food security, a symposium that will have 12 different events in it, and will touch on a wide range of issues in the area of food security and food production. Stanford's program on food security and the environment, which is actually a joint program of two interdisciplinary centers, the Freeman Spoley Center on International Studies and the Woods Institute for the Environment. So at Stanford, not only can interdisciplinary centers be interdisciplinary, but they can actually collaborate amongst themselves to do important work like this. I have to acknowledge the incredible leadership of our colleague, Roz Naylor, in this effort. She has been absolutely tireless in her efforts to promote the importance of this work. And I think, as she just said, this is clearly becoming a critical problem around the world. We're lucky to have her here leading our efforts. 
Stanford was founded in, on the idea that our teaching and research could have a broader positive impact on society. And this area certainly has that kind of possibility. Our work on food security and the environmental impact of food production is critical to the future, not only of our lives here in the United States, but the lives of people around the world. There is no doubt that issues such as rural poverty, access to food, hunger, and environmental degradation are crucial issues throughout the developing world as well as the developed world. And we will need to bring together teams of experts from different disciplines if we're going to make important contributions to this work. Of course, we have a very entrepreneurial faculty, and they're ready to engage in these kinds of problems. But we also have to build new bridges, bridges between the academy and people in industry and NGOs and governments if we're really going to have the kind of impact we'd like to have with this groundbreaking research. So it is my honor and pleasure today to introduce our two speakers leading off these series. One, the head of the world's largest foundation, and the other, the head of the world's largest agricultural firm. I start with Jeff Rakes. As chief executive officer of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Jeff Rakes leads the foundation's efforts to change people's lives for the better. This symposium series is reflective of the type of support that the Gates Foundation encourages. It will generate knowledge that will help alleviate global problems in hunger and poverty and help nations and countries as they struggle with their own development. This series is supported by a grant from the Foundation's Agricultural Development Initiative, which works with a wide range of partners, not only universities like Stanford, but NGOs and government agencies. Both Stanford and the Program on Food Security have benefited from earlier support from the Gates Foundation, and we are deeply grateful. Jeff has been deeply involved in the philanthropic efforts, not only at the foundation, but for many years prior to that. He and his wife, Tricia, founded the Rakes Foundation, which provides opportunities for young people to become healthy, engaged adults. Prior to heading up the Gates Foundation, Jeff was a member of Microsoft's senior leadership for more than two decades. He joined the company in 1983 as a product manager and left in 2008 as president of Microsoft Business Division. In addition to his perspective as CEO of the Gates Foundation, uh, a, jo a job which Jeff calls his dream job, he actually has detailed knowledge about the topic of today's seminar. He is a Nebraska native who is an active owner of a large farming and cattle station in his home state. A Stanford alum, Jeff earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Engineering Economic Systems and for the last three years, we've been fortunate to have him here as a guest lecturer in Stanford's World Food Economy course. So we're delighted on this occasion to have Jeff back on campus. Now, before I turn the podium over to Jeff, I'd like to introduce our second distinguished spe speaker, Greg Page, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer of Cargill Corporation. Founded in 1865, the end of the Civil War, Cargill is now the world's largest privately held corporation, employing 131,000 people in 60 countries. Greg became Cargill's chairman, a CEO, in 2007. He was previously with the company in the role of president. He joined the feed division in 1974 and over the years has been involved in different positions and aspects of the company, including working with the startup in poultry processing in Thailand, beef and pork processing operations in Wichita, Kansas, and the Financial Markets Group in Minneapolis. Cargill has a corporate commitment to make a positive impact on the world by helping to reduce hunger and increase food security and being a careful steward of the world's resources. They have partnered with numerous institutions worldwide and have long been partners with Stanford's program on food security and the environment. At the 2010 World Food Prize, Burlong Dialogue, Greg reiterated Cargill's commitment, saying, we believe it is possible to feed the world's growing population and the stakeholder farmer who is growing crops to sell into markets plays a key role. Increasing the productivity of the smallholder is essential to ensuring food security and alleviating hunger. Greg is an alum of the University of North Dakota where he earned his undergraduate degree in economics and he's active in community services 
and outreach, currently serving on the board of the Big Brothers and Big Sisters of America Foundation. Cargill and the foundation have long supported the work done here at the Institute, endowing a professorship in the program and providing support that enables us to bring important food policy specialists to campus. I also want to take this opportunity to recognize one of our special alums, Pat Bowe, class of 1980, for his ongoing support and involvement in the program. During his time as corporate vice president at Cargill, Pat has taught sustainable, the sustainable agricultural course, but he has deep ties. I counted the number of Stanford alums related to Pat, and it's truly amazing. Not only his wife, several children. Uh, Pat, by the way, played tight end on the Stanford football team from 1976 to 1979. His son Patrick was a tight end. His grandfather was a three-letter winner in the early 1950s who played safety on the 1952 Rose Bowl team. When I read all this, it just confirmed that food and football certainly go together. <laughs> We're pleased that Greg could be here as an inaugural speaker. Uh, please join me in welcoming both and inviting Jeff up to the podium. Well, thank you, President Hennessy, and thank you to all of you for being here uh, today. Uh, the topics that that we want to, to engage in are extremely important for not just our, our country, but for the world. And I know that Greg and I are very much looking forward to engaging in a dialogue with you so that we hope that what our, our remarks will do is to really kick things off and, and uh, encourage you to think about the key issues, key questions on your mind, because uh, many or all of you are gonna play a role in leadership and helping to shape the kind of environment that will lead to a greater level of, of food security and better prosperity through agricultural development. As, uh, as I was sitting here and, and listening to President Hennessy and then looking out, seeing Hoover Tower and the Quad, I was reminded of my first trip to Stanford. Uh, I don't know, how many of you would have come up Palm Drive as you were as you were coming uh, to, to the campus today. Well, as John mentioned, I grew up in Nebraska. My family are farmers. I visited uh, in the winter, I guess it was Christmas holiday of my senior year in high school. And just to show you my decision-making prowess, uh, as my mom and I drove up Palm Drive uh, in that, that uh, setting, it was about 10 below zero in Nebraska, it was about 70 degrees here, and we got to that first intersection on Palm Drive, and I turned to my mom and I said, I think I wanna go here. <laughs> so I said no to UC Davis and yes to Stanford, and I couldn't have been more uh, pleased with the, the opportunity. Uh, as I was in uh, Stanford, I continued, uh, or attending classes here, I continued to enjoy my connection to our family roots. We've been farming in Nebraska since 1854, and we've been in the same location uh, from 1900. And a lot of my Stanford classmates, you know, probably Pat included, would have really amazing jobs during the summer. You know, maybe they were working computer companies or something like that. But what I was doing was I was going back to Nebraska and working on the farm. And so this is a picture from in between my sophomore and in junior year in high school, or I mean in college, and I was back working at the farm, and we had some Australian farmers who were visiting. And that was one of the things that was very special about my father, is he invited people involved in agriculture from all over the world to come to our farm. And so at a very early age, I had the opportunity to meet uh, people from around the world who were involved in farming and understanding uh, their thoughts about agriculture in their country, and it really gave me a sense of, of pride in what we did and what farmers did all around the world. And so here I am showing off an ear of our corn uh, to the Australian farmers uh, in my favorite John Deere shirt. <laughs> I really loved that John Deere shirt. <laughs> and I was very sad when that John Deere shirt no longer fit. <laughs> and it wasn't because the shirt shrunk. Um, so I've always been very connected 
to the work that we do at the foundation with small farmers because of my own agricultural uh, background. We have what many of you would think is a relatively large farm, but we are family farmers. And uh, that's just the difference in scale uh, in today's agriculture. When my father started on our farm in 1932, we had about 240 acres. And it was just, of course, like uh, 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 then, it was just a, our family who was leading that farming operation. And my first foundation trip uh, to Africa, I had the opportunity to be in Kenya. And it was a great introduction for me to see what was happening in agriculture and other parts of the world, and in particular for smallholder farmers in, in Africa. I went to the site of a project that was funded by the Gates Foundation, led by Heifer International with TechnoServe. And at the center of this project was a dairy chilling plant. And it gave me a great opportunity to see the approach of investing across the agricultural value chain. This particular project involved uh, science and technology, better livestock technology, it involved better farm management practices, it involved market access. I loved the concept. The concept was that by having this dairy chilling plant uh, that uh, ultimately is, is uh, farmer owned, uh, what you can do is you can provide a predictable price to the farmer to sell their milk. And this is a big problem for them. The way it, it worked previously is, is that maybe or maybe not a hawker would come by. A hawker is a guy who drives around on a motorcycle and, and may or may not buy your, your milk. So there was no predictable market access for these farmers. Because now with the dairy chilling plant, they had predictable market access. They had a predictable price. That gave them the, the courage to invest in better technology, better dairy cattle. There was artificial insemination service that was provided by the dairy chilling plant. And in addition, the plant also provided extension services so that the farmers could learn how to better handle their, their, their fodder, the, the feed for the cattle, so that they could get a more predictable um, um, amount of milk from the cattle, a higher amount of milk from the cattle on an ongoing basis. So I love the concept. I love the concept. I also love the numbers. In just two or three years, there were now 3,000 farmers in a 25-kilometer radius that were able to access this, this uh, uh, dairy uh, chilling plant and be able to sell their milk. And so I loved it. I loved the numbers. I loved the concept. And you know, there's this old saying about you know, the stories behind the numbers. But that day, I also really learned the importance of the story in front of the numbers. Because I went to a small farmer, uh, uh, a farm couple named David and Lucy. Uh, and David and Lucy farm about four acres. That's the size of their farm. They're supporting their kids. They're supporting each of their parents. And so you're talking about eight people being supported on, on four acres. And so it was really fascinating to, to talk to David and Lucy and really understand uh, how they were able to, to do this. And in one part of the conversation, I said to David, what was his aspiration uh, for the, the next uh, part of the, the next phase of the farm? They said they wanted to rebuild their herd to three cattle. They showed me the one cow that they had. I said, what do you mean rebuild? And they said, because of the the predictable income from the dairy chilling plant, what they had decided to do was to sell two of their cattle to help finance the college degree of their oldest daughter in hotel management in Nairobi. And that's the story in front of the numbers. And I've now had the opportunity myself to see dozens of these stories and to hear about these projects in scale that are, are making this possible for tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of farmers around the world. So I wanted to start out by clearly putting in, in your mind the stories in front of the numbers. And very consistently, whether it's, whether it's uh, cocoa farmers or if I'm talking to coffee farmers in Uganda, very consistently 
What I hear is when they are able to improve their incomes, the first thing they do with the money is to invest it in the education of their children. So I think what you can see is the ripple effect that is, is created uh, by this. And, and so I wanted to start there. I really wanted to put that picture into your mind before I delve. And before I delve into the details of our agricultural work, I want to talk a little bit uh, more generally about the Gates Foundation. Uh, what are our goals and how do we hope to achieve them? When Bill and Melinda uh, created the, the Gates Foundation, they had a principle that all lives have equal value, yet as they travel around the world, we can clearly see that that's not how the world operates. There are significant in inequities. And so the Gates Foundation starts with the principle of how can we invest our resources, whether that be financial, intellectual, other types of resources, how can we invest in ways that will really help all people to have the chance to live a healthy and productive life. And of course, since we're somewhat, from the computer industry, somewhat numbers oriented, somewhat data oriented, we're always thinking about leverage, where can we get the greatest uh, amount of leverage uh, for our, our investments? And so we, we think in that way. We also think about the fact that the marketplace that made Microsoft so successful doesn't respond to the needs of poor people. Uh, Bill, if you hear him talk about these issues, you'll often hear Bill talk about market failures. There are, we're big believers in the market system, but there are obviously cases where there is not a market opportunity that causes the investment or encourages the investment that can really make a difference for people. So we look at those opportunities uh, or those market failures as opportunities to guide our, our investments. Another thing that comes from our background in the high technology industry is our belief in innovation. Because of our belief in innovation, even though you can look at this world, the developing world, the poor people, their circumstances, and be somewhat um, shocked, we have optimism. We have optimism that science and technology and system approaches and other innovations can really make a difference. But again, the benefits don't always, of innovation don't always accrue to poor people. Uh, but we think that the tools are available to help address many of these critical problems, and I want to explain that a little more clearly. What I'm leading up to by talking about market failures as an opportunity, by talking about technology and science as a, a foundation for innovation, what I'm talking about or what I'm leading up to is the idea that we have the opportunity to be catalytic. And so I want to give you a sense of a three-legged stool. On one leg, you have the private sector, and we are big believers in capitalism. We think capitalism is an incredibly efficient approach to allocate resources in society in order to encourage goods and services that help raise the overall quality of life. That's a very, very important uh, part of, of our world. And it is that profit motive in the private sector that encourages the risk-taking that leads to those advances. But of course, that gets back to this point about market opportunity. In order to have the profit, you have to have a market opportunity. Now, let me contrast that a little bit with the public sector. In the public sector, our tax dollars go toward goods and services, we hope, that help to raise the quality of life, whether it's education or other aspects that, that uh, in democracy are, uh, are believed to be important. But of course, the public sector is less risk-oriented. I mean, after all, do you want the government taking a lot of risk with your tax dollars? So on the one hand, you have the private sector, which will take risk and create goods and services. You'll have the public sector who is less oriented to taking risk. But how are we going to handle those market failures? And that's where I'm leading to the third leg of, stool, of the stool, which is what we believe to be catalytic philanthropy. I distinguish that from operational philanthropy, which is very important, where philanthropy fills in the, the gaps in society. But in catalytic philanthropy, our opportunity in the sweet spot of where we want to be at the Gates Foundation is to identify where, with our 
investments, we can create an innovation, a new intervention that can really raise the quality of lives for people, determine and identify the evidence of that success so that then that intervention can be scaled up and sustained by the private sector if we can show that there is a profit opportunity or the public sector if we can show that this is a better way to improve the, uh, the overall quality of society through the investment of public dollars. And so that is catalytic philanthropy. John mentioned that we are a large foundation. But in reality, the amount of money we invest each year is a very, very, very small percentage of the overall need. So the only way we can really have the kind of impact, the only way we can live up to this aspiration of trying to, to change people's lives so that they can all have uh, a chance for a healthy, productive life is to be very catalytic in our thinking. So I wanted to to lay that out for you so you had an understanding of where we are, we are coming from. I'll just quickly touch on our areas of focus so that I can put our agricultural work in context. I mentioned to you earlier that we look for those opportunities where we can have the greatest impact from our dollars invested. And clearly, Bill and Melinda early on saw the opportunity to take advantage of medicines in the developed world, like vaccines, and get them to the kids in the developing world. And so about 50% or so of our payout goes to global health, trying to reduce the infectious disease burden in the developing world, and in particular for poor, uh, for poor children. About 25% of our payout goes in the US program, and in particular goes to education, because we see that the biggest opportunity that we may have to provide a catalytic impact in our country is to improve the public education system so that we have a higher number of, of, of kids who are, who are graduating from high school prepared for, uh, to succeed in college or to succeed uh, in their careers. And then about 20 to 25 percent of our, our payout goes towards global development. And this is something that really came along in the wake of, of Warren Buffett's commitment and his gift to the, the Gates Foundation. There are about 1.1 to 1.3 billion people in the world who live in extreme poverty. The definition of extreme poverty is, quote, unquote, a dollar per day. About more than a billion people live in extreme poverty. 70 to 75 percent of those people live in rural areas. They're dependent on subsistence agriculture for their livelihoods, for their lives. And so that really helps to take me to my next topic, which is why did we decide to get involved in agriculture? And it's this simple math that three quarters of the world's poorest people rely on farming for their food and income. Now, one of the things that you'll, you'll quickly see is that the poorest farmers in the world, these smallholder farmers in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, aren't anywhere near achieving the potential. So here's a chart that shows uh, rain-fed yields. So that simply means without irrigation uh, in the... Uh, OECD countries, the rich world countries, in sub-Saharan Africa and, world, and the world average. So this is a, a projection of potential yield based on, on what would be possible given soil types and other, um, other factors. But what's the actual yield? Well, you can see in the developed world, we're pretty close to the projection of potential. But you see where we are in sub-Saharan Africa. And let me just remind all of you that in sub-Saharan Africa, 95% of agriculture is rain-fed. There's very little irrigation. Now let's take a, a, another look. Uh, this look will be at irrigated yields. And I'm going to, again, start out with the potential yields based on soil types and factors. And you have the, developing world, uh, the developed world, the rich world, in the left-hand chart, you have South Asia, primarily India, Bangladesh, uh, in the center. So you can see potential yield quite high. Let's look at the actual yield. So again, in the developed world, in the rich world, we're very close to the potential. 
You can see the world average on the far right, and you can see where we are today in South, A South Asia. Again, where in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, where the significant majority of these smallholder farmers uh, live in the world. So this gives you a sense of, of where we are in terms of the, uh, the potential. Now, if the goal is to help the poor smallholder farmers exit and their families exit from extreme poverty so that you can increase the amount of food that they have to eat, so that you can increase their income. This, these two slides really help to, to uh, illustrate the importance of agricultural development. The obvious conclusion is that if small farmers can increase their productivity, it will have a very huge impact on hunger and poverty. And we like to say that agriculture and prosperity grow together. But of course, there are a lot of challenges, and I want to talk about some of the challenges. Um, I'll mention climate change. The places that will suffer the most severe weather are the places where the poorest farmers live. Another big challenge is water scarcity. Uh, this is something that, that I've been very interested in as I go through the calculation of what it's, what's going to be required in terms of food production uh, during the next 40 years or so. We're going to have to have nearly a doubling of food production to handle the world population in an environment where, due to climate change and other issues, water is going to be more and uh, more scarce. So these, again, you see the mapping of water scarcity, and you can see how that maps to areas where you have poor smallholder farmers. I like to, to focus in on the idea of, of more crop per drop. Uh, this actually is a picture from, from my home state, state of Nebraska. This is Lake McConaughey. What you're seeing here is a boat ramp. Okay, that is a boat ramp. Uh, when I was growing up, my father talked about the Ogallala Aquifer. I think he said to me it was the second largest underground body of water in the world. He talked about the rich soils of Nebraska, the unlimited water resources that we had, and how you know agriculture in, in the Midwest could feed the world. That was my, my father's belief, and, and I loved his, his passion. Today I look at Lake McConaughey, and I see what's happened to that, that water resource. Let me take you on a little trip around the world. Uh, this is a, a place called Jeleng uh, in China. And you can see what's happened to the riverbed in the uh, 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 side of this 30 million city. Uh, this is uh, in Gujarat, uh, where, uh, in India, where you're seeing incredibly low groundwater. Um, and basic problem here, are rivers are drying up, groundwater levels are dropping. And if we're going to be able to feed the world, we're going to have to figure out how to achieve more crop per drop. So climate change is a challenge. Water scarcity is a challenge. The economic crisis is a challenge. It's putting pressure on budgets in both donor and developing countries. The G20 committed as part of their, their gathering in 2009. They committed $22 billion to agricultural development. Why did they do that? Because of the importance of agricultural development to food security. Because of the recognition that over the previous 20 years, the amount of investment that had gone into agriculture, especially uh, on behalf of the developing world, had declined dramatically. I've forgotten the number now, but it was something like 80, 85%. People didn't believe, and starting in the early 80s, they didn't believe it was an important investment anymore. So now people have started to turn and believe, and $22 billion was committed by the G20 countries. The Global, food uh, Global Agriculture and Food Security Trust Fund was put in place, and it was launched less than a year ago uh, with commitments from many of these G20 countries. $224 million went to five countries in the first round of grants in June. By November, when 21 additional countries submitted their proposals, 
Just $97 million was available to be dispersed. And 17 countries were turned away empty-handed. So big commitments to agricultural development, but not the follow-through on those, those commitments. So those are challenges, the economic crisis, what it's doing in terms of pressure on budgets, climate change, water scarcity. And these challenges are reasons that some of the people have a bit of a doomsday strain in their rhetoric about development. However, despite the challenges, we've made a lot of progress, and I want to share with you some of the evidences to that effect and, and encourage you to have some optimism and to think about how your leadership can come together to help shape the, the kind of policy environment, research and development uh, environment, resource environment, in order to be able to, to have the kind of success that the world needs. First of all, I want to mention a little bit about our own direct response on these challenges. As I mentioned in the uh, middle part, uh, or three, three to five years ago, we really began to ramp up our agricultural work. And we committed uh, $300 million in six grants to span the value chain, to go across science and technology, farm management practices, farmer productivity, and uh, market access, as well as the, the data and policy environment to support uh, our work. The grants that we put in place uh, are intended to support about five and a half million farm families in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, so quite a number of, uh, of families. And we're already starting to see uh, progress. I mentioned to you David and Lucy and the progress I saw in the um, East Africa Dairy Project. Uh, Tricia, my wife who's here, she and I visited Uganda. There are 1.2 million coffee farmers in Uganda. 950,000 of them produce Robusta coffee. We have a project that is supporting 15,000 farmers to improve, uh, Robusta coffee farmers to improve their market access, to improve the, the coffee uh, plants that they have available and the farm management practices to get greater uh, uh, greater productivity. And that project is on track to triple the, the income of those smallholder coffee farmers within a five-year period of time. So whether it's cocoa, cotton, soy, all of which we work on with, with Greg and, and Cargill or other types of crops, we're seeing progress. We're seeing uh, these examples. This has really been a test case of our... Um, of our strategy, and you can go to our website. We want to always improve our transparency. You can go to our website and learn about what we're working on, what's working, what isn't working uh, as well, so that we can continue to improve the dialogue uh, around these, these opportunities. These are really, in our view, a case study of, of what's needed. As Bill Gates said at the World Food Prize event about 15 months ago, the world needs higher yields on the same amount of land in harsher weather conditions. And if we're going to achieve this, we need to have a continuous, urgent, science-based search as to how we can increase farmer productivity. And this can come from both high-tech and low-tech. Let me give you uh, an example here. Uh, this is a, a, a plot of rice that shows the difference between two, two types of rice. The one on the left, which you no longer see, and the one on the right. The one on the right has what is known as the sub-1 gene. It's a submergent gene that allows the rice to survive being underwater for several days. I think it's up to 15 days. So in areas of rice farming where they're prone to flooding, which can wipe out the crop, just as you see there on the left, there is now a variety of rice, a hybrid of rice that's available that can withstand this submergence. And that is now being used by 400,000 farmers and on track to be used by about 20 million rice farmers by 2017. So there's a great example of of what is possible from better crop breeding, better science in the agricultural area. 
And we primarily support conventional breeding, but we also support uh, some biotechnology breeding because in some cases, we think that the breeders in Africa, the breeders in South Asia, will want to take advantage of the modern tools that we use here in our country in order to provide better choices for their farmers. Whether that's for crops that can withstand drought, can withstand flooding, could withstand disease and, uh, and pests. So the high-tech examples are, are very important, but so are the low-tech examples. This is a product of a grant uh, that we made to Purdue University. Uh, this is a $2 triple layer bag for cowpeas. Costs the farmer $2. What it does is the triple layer reduces the loss of the crop from pests. It's an increase, average increase per farmer of $150 a year. So $2 bag, $150 uh, increase. So sometimes the solution is higher tech. Sometimes the solution is, is lower tech. So those are two good examples of why we have reason to have optimism. We see from our experience of working with farmers uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, we see the pace of research and development. And despite current budgetary issues, we have some reason to be optimistic about what's happening on that front. Uh, recently, we saw that, that U.S. agricultural development assistance to sub-Saharan Africa has gone from about 650 million in 2005 to about 1.5 billion in 2009. And you can bet that we are trying to use our voice in an appropriate way to encourage the kind of continued commitment of this sort of investment by our government and other develop, developed world uh, governments in order to provide for greater agricultural prosperity and food security around the world. And the investment is coming not only from a foreign assistance or um, the developed world. In developing countries, you have CADAP, the uh, Comprehensive Agricultural Development Program in Africa that was proposed in 2003 where the countries themselves would dedicate 10% of their national budgets to agriculture. And with the goal of improving annual agricultural growth by 6%. 20 countries in Africa have signed on to the CADAP uh, compacts and 10 countries are exceeding the 6% growth target. So that's another reason why we are optimistic. And a final reason why we're optimistic is both the macro statistics as well as some of the country statistics. If you look at what's happened since 1990, about 1.3 billion people worldwide have lifted themselves out of poverty, primarily through improvements in agricultural productivity. Now, a lot of that was from China. But we see other great examples. I'm going to speak a little bit about Ghana. I know Greg will as well. But since 1990, in Ghana, Cassava production, which is a, an important staple food for uh, uh, poor smallholder farmers, cassava production has increased fivefold. Tomato production has increased sixfold. The cocoa sector has been revived and hunger has been cut by 75%. Now, how did that happen in Ghana? And how does that relate to your work as leaders in this sector? It was a combination of getting the right developing country policy with the right macroeconomic reform, the right institutional reform, smart public in, uh, investment, and an overall good policy environment. So by setting the right environment, these kinds of, of uh, optimistic growth targets can be met. Now, as we look ahead, I want to just mention a couple of things that I think are important that I'd like you to, to, to have in mind. There are a couple elements about the small farmer that I think are very important and may not be as obvious to you sitting here in, in beautiful Stanford, California. 70% or more of the farm labor population is women. 70%. So gender is extremely important. When Trisha and I were visiting with the smallholder farmers in Uganda, one of the fascinating aspects of that project was a gender specialist who really helped to bring together the, 
the husband and the wife and how they work together to maximize the productivity of the farm, to create that kind of a dialogue, to create that kind of, uh, of joint work. But throughout all of our work in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia, we think about the importance of, of, of women and how they are key contributors to agriculture. And so if you want to advance agricultural productivity, you have to make sure that women are included in the equation. And of course, you have to make sure that the farmer in general is included in the equation. You have to make sure that their voice is heard, is a part of choosing the right varieties, the right kind of, uh, of characteristics, the understanding what it will take in order to incent them to adopt these uh, kinds of farm management practices. Because I mentioned earlier, as I mentioned earlier, if you want to be catalytic, what you have to do is you have to make sure that you understand how the market system will scale up and sustain these kinds of, of successful practices. And the last point I want to make in looking ahead has to do with partnership. And that's a very important part of this, this sympo symposium. We have to figure out, especially in this tough environment, how we're going to get the most out of every dollar invested. So how do you bring together the research consortia, like the Consultative Group on International Agricultural Research? How do you bring the, together the governments, both in the developed world as well as in the developing world? The NGOs like Heifer and TechnoServe, the farmer groups that can help us hear the voice of the farmers in these countries, and the private sector. This is an example of where we are investing in building local capacity. We have a significant part of our agricultural work in AGRA, the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, because it is led by Africans for the benefit of, of Africans. And so bringing together these partnerships is, is extremely important. But if we do this and we do this well, we can create the environment for success for all farmers. I reflect on another example. I was in Mozambique uh, less than a year ago. I was there looking at some uh, orange flesh sweet potato work, but also some International Rice Research Institute work. And then I kind of snuck away from uh, the, the speeches that were going on, and I talked to a couple of farmers on the side. And it was very interesting. Their plots of land were in the same area, actually adjacent with each other. And one set of farmers, representing about 50 hectares, were expecting a yield of about one and a half tons to two tons of rice per hectare. And the other was expecting about five to six tons of rice per hectare because they had a difference in how they were using irrigation, how they were using better inputs, both the varieties of rice and, and fertilizer. And it reminded me of what is possible if we can bridge this gap between the potential yield and the actual yield. And so what's incumbent upon us is how do we do our best work to create the environment for all farmers to be successful, which will lead to food security, and prosperity. So thank you very much. Good afternoon. One slide on Cargill and the role that we play in the world of food and agriculture. Five key segments to Cargill's business. First, one for which we've been long known, which is the role of taking food and crops from times and places of surplus to times and places of deficit. And certainly, we're living in one of those moments. Second, providing farmers with a variety of services and, and inputs, and importantly, access to markets. Third, our food ingredients and meat business, everything from malt for beer to uh, sweeteners for beverage to vegetable oils uh, for cooking and other purposes, and in a growing list of ingredients around nutrition and wellness. And finally, we have a large risk management activity where we trade agricultural commodities, ocean freight, petroleum, natural gas, electricity, iron ore, and a whole list of, of base metals. And certainly, the prices of all these commodities interact with each other and shape uh, the world in which we live. 
Uh, President Hennessy already covered Cargill's long uh, relationship with Stanford, and so I won't repeat that. Cargill's relationship with the Gates Foundation, Jeff already mentioned it, but I would speak to three specific projects where we're working together. The first uh, is in the Ivory Coast, uh, Ghana, Cameroon, where we're working to reach out and touch and train 200,000 cocoa farmers. That is a lot of education. And to do that, uh, one tribe and one small village at a time, but to help them with the food safety of their products, the quality maintenance, and storage, which clearly has a benefit for us and our customers later on in the supply chain. The second is the Competitive Africa Cotton Initiative. Certainly cotton farmers in the world, after more than a decade of suffering under below cost prices, are now in the golden era for that industry. And the benefit of the training programs that we're doing in conjunction uh, with the Gates Foundation to help 265,000 farmers in Benin, Burkina Faso, the Ivory Coast, Malawi, Uganda, and Zambia is going to have a really great impact when you combine the power and the energizing effect of good price with the tools that we believe we can share with them in conjunction with the Gates Foundation. And finally, the South African Soy Value Chain Program just being conducted in Zambia and Mozambique but certainly soy has a great opportunity to enhance not just the caloric content of people's diets, but the uh, protein density. And we're excited about that project, albeit a difficult one. I think many people think of Cargill as being the company of large farmers. And in fact, working with the farmers of California and the Midwest of the US, the plains of Canada, uh, Brazil and Argentina are an important part of our supply chain. But there's a whole other side to Cargill, and particularly in the tropical crops. In Zimbabwe last year, we purchased cotton from 47,000 different farmers, more than 35,000 of whom received all of their financing from Cargill. In Zambia, we purchased cotton from more than 41,000 farmers, and again, two-thirds of them looked to Cargill as their banker for seeds and inputs. In the Ivory Coast in Ghana last year, we purchased uh, cocoa beans from almost a quarter of a million individual farmers. And in Sumatra, we run a large nucleus palm plantation surrounded by 8,000 smallholders, wherein we market, process, and take to the world their crops in conjunction with ours and can harvest uh, the logistical advantage of scale by working with a nucleus farm and thousands of smallholders that surround that nucleus. So to the issue of today's conversation, food security, and particularly the insecurity suffered by so many, a billion people, the Food and Agricultural Organization's estimate of the number of people who lack sufficient caloric uh, intake on a daily basis. Where are these billion people? By prevalence, most of the 10 countries are in sub-Saharan Africa. So the largest proportion of those nations' population who su suffer malnourishment. In sub-Saharan Africa, about 38% of all children are chronically malnourished. And this chronic malnourishment uh, was discussed by Jeff, and it really is an issue of inability to have adequate agricultural productivity. But it's a more difficult issue than that. And so while nine of the 10 countries that have the highest prevalence of malnourishment are in sub-Saharan Africa, the two countries with the largest absolute number of malnourished people are India in China. And I think it points to the difficulty of this problem when you consider that India exports corn and soybean protein, and China has two and a half trillion dollars of hard currency reserves. So these are issues not necessarily of ability to feed people, but a willingness and a commitment to doing so. And so I think a lot of the common press under portrays or insufficiently portrays the complexity of hunger when you consider the facts captured on this slide. So I have a chance to talk to audiences all over. And invariably, the first question Cargill is asked, can the world feed itself? There's a very unequivocal answer, yes. Yes now, yes in the future. And I'll talk a little bit about why that is the case in, in spite of what the media may portray at this moment. The FAO keeps wonderful statistics. And so they take this one billion people and they break it down country by country. But they go a step further. And they break it down by the number of calories per day that the people are undernourished. And so if you take the two databases that they have and multiply them together, you come up with the degree of undernourishment. And we converted those number of calories into the number of tons of grain required 
to extinguish that hunger, about 30 million tons, or about one-sixth of the amount of foodstuffs that we converted into fuel last year as a globe. And so did we produce enough calories last year to extinguish hunger in this world? Absolutely. Did we elect to do it? No, we didn't. But it isn't an issue of caloric famine. It is an issue of economic famine. So what do we have to do about this? And the biggest thing we have to do is, since it is not a food supply problem, it is, in fact, the inability to have the purchasing power to pay for a diet. So it is an issue of the economic capacity to put enough price into the agricultural system to create sustainable agriculture. Certainly water is important, seed is important, technology is important, agronomy is important, but the fundamental ingredient of sustainable agriculture is adequate price to reward the farmer for his efforts and provide enough money that he can do it again, or excuse me, she can do it again the following year. So what problem are we trying to solve for? Are we trying to feed the world as quickly as possible? Or are we trying to do it in a manner that's consistent with the real rural sociology challenges that confront us? And I think I could make a good case for the fact that if Africa wanted to feed itself most quickly, the way to do it would be with scale farming. But having done that, I think you would be confronted very quickly with a rural sociology problem and enormous urban rural to urban migration. And so what we face as a world is the need to keep smallholders on the farm in spite of the fact that they may not be the low cost producer of foodstuffs in order to avoid an urban rural population migration that would be unsustainable. And so the challenge the world faces is who's going to pay that rural sociology premium. If it costs more to raise crops on small farms, is that burden going to be borne by the urban poor, or is there going to be an alternative funding mechanism that allows those smallholders to succeed? Jeff mentioned the fact that we had a chance to hear about an Agra project uh, in Davos a couple weeks ago that's being carried out in Ghana. And the model there is to go to one of the richest, probably the richest part of Ghana, in terms of water resources and soil resources, and to put a combination of scale farmers to bring logistical power and quantity into the fore, and at the same time to raise the standard of living of 250,000 smallholder farmers who will farm in and around uh, those nucleus commercial scale farms and benefit from high quality grain storage, the prevention of waste, and the logistical advantage of moving Large, larger quantities of foodstuffs into Accra and the other uh, population centers of the country. So what is the survival price for a smallholder? <clears throat> the graph basically captures for any income level you wish to solve for the price that a farmer would have to receive. And so if you wanted a family of four on a farm uh, in sub-Saharan Africa to receive an income somewhat commensurate with the average per capita or per family income of the urban population. If you solve for the inputs necessary to do it and the income that you wanted that person to have, you'd come up with a price over $500 a ton. And to put that in context, the highest price for maize that's ever been reached here in the US is about 275. And so this rural sociology premium to sustain smallholders is not an insignificant amount of money. Some of you are old enough to remember a famous senator from Minnesota, Paul Wellstone. And he and I had different views about how agriculture might be carried out. But he was always an eager debater. And we had a discussion about his vision for what American agriculture should look like. And I tell this story because this issue isn't simply one of sub-Saharan Africa or South Asia. And his belief was that a small farmer in the US should be able to make a living wage his words. And so I asked him what his definition of a small farmer was, which is something that's not yet been resolved in any nation that I know of. And he said, 40 dairy cows. I said, fair enough. What's a living wage? And this was a few years ago. Uh, I think he said $28,000 a year. So we sat down and we penciled out something similar to this graph. 
that would have to raise the price of milk in every grocery store in Minnesota by about 50%. He looked at me for a minute and he said, do that again for 60 cows. <laughs> and so this Wellstonian principle is one that we're all going to face, which is do it again for two hectares or do it again for three hectares. And I think in making those judgments, we're going to come uh, face to face with some good realities, but also the enormity of the task and how do we get that fairness between the revenue received by the rural smallholder and the price borne by the urban consumer. We had a chance to talk uh, in the meeting room prior about the fact that we are in a time of incredible volatility in commodity prices, really a reflection of the continuous state of disequilibrium. I'm always fascinated by the fact how many stories are written when prices go up 60 percent, but in 2009 when they went down 60 percent, I didn't really see a lot of ink shared. And so this disequilibrium uh, has occurred in the last two and a half years in both directions and to a degree greater than we've seen at any time in the past. So the next graph I think captures the impact that we've seen with very small changes in production and the outsized impact that they've had on price. Earlier this week, the U.S. government announced that the size of the carryover stocks of corn in the United States had changed by a little over 1 million tons, about 1.7 million tons. The government announced they'd gone down. The price of corn in the United States, and along with it, the price of wheat and soybeans, went up 3.5%. So to put that in context, the quantity changed by 1.7 tons in a crop of 300 tons in this country alone. And the global price of maize went up by 3.5%. And so those outsized impacts of very small quantity changes on price are captured uh, in this graphic. And you can see how it's becoming increasingly erratic as we've gone through the last several years. So the next one is world stock to use. Certainly a number that Cargill follows very closely is the, the one on the right-hand side. And you can multiply that stocks to use ratio by 365 days, and you can get a sense of how close to the edge we're operating our global food system. And clearly, as you look back through the 80s, through the early part of 2000, 2003, the world operated with fairly robust stocks. And as a result, we had relatively muted price volatility. On the other side of the coin, what the graph doesn't show is this was a period where the Western world probably did more harm to Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia than any other period in history. Because we refused as societies to allow price to signal farmers in Western Europe and the United States to produce less. And so we provided subsidies. And the signal of price, which would have been to slow down, to stop, to take marginal land out of production, we continued to produce. And so as a result of that, the world price of grains fell far below the ability of any smallholder to compete. And we shipped those surpluses to those countries that, as Jeff mentioned, failed to invest in their agriculture for several decades. About seven or eight years ago, at the really bottom of the cotton price, I had a chance to speak to the Minnesota Corn Growers Convention. And I always find with audiences, I try to use agricultural examples that don't apply to them. <laughs> it, it really helps the question and answer period, is, is the truth. And so I use the example of cotton. So here I am in Minnesota, I'm talking to corn growers. To my chagrin, one of the guy's brother-in-laws was a cotton farmer from Plainview, Texas, and he happened to be in the audience. <laughs> And so having said that what the American Farm Bill and the subsidization of cotton at 50% over the world price had done to our smallholder farmers in Zimbabwe was unconscionable. And when the question answer period started, he tackled the person with the microphone and spoke first <laughs> and said he refused to take responsibility for the plight of Africa's poor. And I said he was welcome to refuse to take responsibility, but it didn't make it not so. And uh, the question and answer period spiraled out of control after that. But, <laughs> but the point is that the, the behavior of governments and farmers in one place 
through this very interconnected world have an enormous impact on the investment decisions and the well-being of people other places. So here we go, spiraling from complacency to crisis. In 2009, we raised a couple percent more calories than it looked like the world was going to consume, and prices plummeted 40 or 50 percent. In 2010, arguably, we produced less than 2 percent less calories than we expected when we planted the crop, and prices are up 80 percent or more depending on the commodity. And it may be one case where having a wired and interconnected world has hurt us, the ability of information to be transmitted rapidly, and by that, for hyperbole to find its way into the purchasing decisions of thousands or millions of consumers. And we see it. If everything you read in the paper is that the world's going to have higher priced food or it's going to run out, what is the instinct of every household in the world? And we can see it in the demand. Restaurants, small restaurants that we serve with vegetable oil in China. Our truck goes by and instead of buying five kilos this week, they buy 10. It's their hedge and multiplied by millions of restaurants. The story I tell, because I heard it from the <clears throat> man who was the president of Kafko, who's uh, one of the largest probably food organization in, in China. And he had visited his mother's apartment, and he went into her apartment, and on the floor were four 25-kilo bags of white rice. Mm -hmm. His mother's 80-some years old and lives by herself. <laughs> and he said, what? What are you doing? <laughs> And she said that she'd read there was going to be a food crisis, and the price was going to go up, and there was going to be a shortage. And he said, now there is. <laughs> and so we can laugh, but it is not so much speculation in the power of price that's created by speculation as the power and the impact on price that's created by hoarding. And clearly, we've been confronted with hoarding at an individual and household level, and certainly we've been uh, confronted with hoarding at a governmental level as exporters close their borders, and as people who feel at risk double their purchases, or in some case, triple their purchases to protect themselves at the expense of the collective good. We won't go through all of these. I think there's a great desire when we see food prices or something we don't like go up to have a single villain. In fact, it's a very complicated problem. And some of the drivers are good things, like the increase in per capita income and the capacity of more people to have a more dense and, and more nutritious diet. So I'll quickly pass on to the real issue is the power of price. And I often say that the, the rules of agriculture are set by three very stern economists, Hayek, Ricardo, and Smith. And if you ignore either of the three, you will get in trouble. And certainly Hayek was a proponent of the behavioral changing power of price. And so I think the dialogue that's gone on in the world of late is that price serves only one role. It's a harbinger of inflation. But in fact, we get to see through our business that it is a signal to producers everywhere to do what we want them to do, which is to grow more. And in those countries where they intervene that price, they fail to send that encouragement to their farmers. Four years ago, as the price of food started to go up in Argentina, the government imposed price controls on beef. Here we are four years later. The size of the beef herd in Argentina is down 25% in four years as the power of price to encourage production rather than to discourage participation took over. And I think that we really need to be mindful. Yes, there is a burden on the world's poor as price rises, but we are getting one positive uh, outcome of that, and that is the signaling price to the world's producers. Interesting statistic, at least to me, is it appears that the world's farmers will apply more than 12% more fertilizer in 2011 than they did in 2009. If we get any kind of reasonable weather, that is going to have an outsized impact on the world's capacity to grow uh, the calories that we need. The next one is just on comparative advantage. And certainly, we get a lot of opportunities to speak with people in various governments whose response to the events like those we've seen in the last three years is to pursue self-sufficiency. And I think the only thing I'll say is to leave it at, if every country on Earth tried to pursue self-sufficiency, there would absolutely be less food in the world because we are not equally endowed by climate or by weather um, to be self-sufficient. And as a result of that, the role of trust-based free trade becomes increasingly important if we're going to exploit 
uh, Ricardo's comparative advantage. My most obnoxious example of that is we have the technology to raise all the orange juice we need to in Minnesota. We just shouldn't. <laughs> and I think if you take that, and granted it's an exaggeration, but we see it. I was in Saudi Arabia the second week of January, and they have finally taken the decision to back away from irrigated wheat agriculture. They were using 18 billion cubic meters of water a year in the whole country, 16 for agriculture and only two for all of their industrial and urban use, nine times. So simply by making that decision, the capacity of the Saudis to extend the life cycle of their Ogallala aquifer goes up ninefold. And by trading with others, by bringing capital into the Sudan uh, to improve their agriculture, the world's going to be better off. We'll use more rain fed, and, and they will preserve their water resources. So I think the concept of comparative advantage is obvious, but, but often ignored. So I'll go through just a couple of things that we think are critical. Rural property rights is a big issue. If you want a farmer to reinvest in his farm, he needs to know he owns it. Seems like a simple principle, but it's most often ignored. And I don't know if you all saw it, but there's a great article in the Wall Street Journal on Monday, 7th of February, that talked about one of the underpinning root causes of what's going on in Egypt today is the lack of property rights, the uncertainty they have about what they own and their willingness to reinvest in it. And I think not a better example is needed. Increased revenue certainty, and we've talked about the price required to sustain rural sociology, and so we won't go through those one by one. But I think it is important to point out, if you look at the three countries that benefited most from Norman Borlaug's Green Revolution 30-some years ago, India, Mexico, and China. And in each case, they had the government, and governmental and institutional capacity to give some degree of revenue certainty to their farmers where increases in productivity did not lead to precipitous drops in their income. And as a result of it, the big winners in the first Green Revolution were those three countries. And I think the policy prescription of that is quite clear for Africa and parts of South Asia. I refer to it as a Solomonic price because Cargill does not want to set it. <laughs> that, but the fact is that each of these governments, particularly in places like Ghana, that have the capacity to feed themselves, as do many of the countries in Central Africa, they're going to have to make the decision about what is the price they want to get to their farmers in order to motivate the behavior they need to raise their productivity and their yields. And that decision is not an easy one as they balance the needs of their urban consumers and their farmers. But it's a discussion that needs to take place. And hopefully, multilateral groups, NGOs, and others, the World Bank, can help in that discussion. And finally, not surprisingly, open markets that I think the ability to harvest the benefits of comparative advantage literally depend on the capacity to have open, trust-based free markets. And so I think clearly the roles of government in doing that are significant, and we've seen the other side of it as Russia and the Ukraine and Argentina have uh, turned to embargoes as a way to protect domestic inflation and thereby uh, frighten the rest of the world against an open market, free trade-based food system. So in summary, to go over five elements that we think are critically important, I guess there are six. <laughs> Six elements that we think, I'm sure the list will grow by next week, that are really important for having this increased food security. First, the ability to understand the trade-offs between a fast path to caloric sufficiency and the needs of rural sociology. Second, that crops be grown the right soil with the right technology and uh, relying on free trade so we can harvest comparative advantage. Third, the critical importance of property rights if we're going to get the working capital necessary to encourage further investment in farming. The smallholders in these countries need some degree of revenue certainty if we expect them to do what their countries really need them to do. Trust-based free trade that's open and facilitated by all. And the private sector's role in being a strong partner in marketing these crops, but also, and importantly, working with people like the Gates Foundation. I love the expression catalytic philanthropy. 
because at some point it ceases to be philanthropy at all. It just becomes the success of those nations. And so I think this public, public private, and philanthropic uh, partnership can have, be a powerful force. And finally, we believe that there are a lot of very important roles in the creation of infrastructure for the world's governments. So I appreciate the chance to, to share these thoughts with you. I do want to end with the one that I believe fully and completely in the world's capacity to harvest photosynthesis to feed every single person and to do it at a price that can be borne by all. Thank you. My name is Wally Falcon, and I want to add my thanks to all of you for coming. And I especially want to thank our two speakers for really having provided us with a bounteous plate. It's my task, I hope it will be an easy one, uh, to now facilitate a dialogue between them and you. There are a lot of yous, and there are not very many of thems, and so I guess they chose me because of my size to be the referee. So I'm going to join the group over there, and uh, while I'm doing that, and as you think of your succinct questions, uh, I, I'm going to cross up the process by adding one of my own. <laughs> to get us started, uh, the Wall Street Journal this morning had a, a long quote about rising, exploding prices, and the quote in there was, the markets have changed in a structural way due to ethanol. What do you think about that question? And what I'm wondering about is how does the Gates Foundation and how does Cargill think about ethanol in the, in the kinds of grant-making strategies that you have at Gates and in terms of your corporate strategies uh, there at, uh, at Cargill? I'll join you as you uh, get your thoughts ready, and then we'll turn to questions from the audience. Sir, um, I learned very quickly uh, from Greg. So actually, I guess what I f should do is ask, how many uh, owners of ethanol plants are here in the audience? <laughs> the Plainview, Texas cotton farmer. <laughs> that story shaped my view. I understand. <laughs> um, we, at the Gates Foundation, uh, I'll... I'll uh, I, I feel like I should punt to Roz because I think we gave Roz uh, Naylor a grant to help figure this out. So, you know, Roz knows more about it than I do. But let me just give you some, some high-level points. We're, much like Greg, we're big believers in economics. And so the issue that we see relative to biofuels, probably as much as anything, relates to distorting uh, the demand, the, I think it's 51 cents a gallon subsidy for for ethanol, which, if I remember correctly, uh, goes goes to the oil companies. There's an irony there that Greg understands more than I do, and and our concern is just the way in which the the subsidization system distorts market uh, prices and potentially leads to, um, you know issues of inefficiency, much like I think what Greg was saying about uh, the learning from the 80s and 90s in terms of the way in which there was market distortion due to the amount of subsidization going into developed world agriculture, in particular US and, and um, uh, Europe. So for us, the number one issue would be the, the distortion that occurs. Uh, I think there's more learning to do, certainly on my part, about the relationship of the usage of, of corn that goes into ethanol plants but comes out and is still then part of the food supply because it goes to cattle feeders. And so I think the naive person uh, would think there's a one-to-one -one substitute uh, meaning if you use 40% of the corn crop for ethanol, that's taken out of the food supply. That's actually not quite, quite accurate. And so I think you then have that secondary factor that you need to, to, to go through. Okay, a couple things. I think one, uh, 
serves us well to think about the history of it. And the ethanol program in the US and the biodiesel program in the Europe is really a child of the period of surpluses. And as Jeff said, a period when most farmers were operating below their cost of production, that agricultural reinvestment had really ceased and we had the distortion of direct subsidies in, in commodity prices, but only in the Western world. So the upside of the ethanol and the biofuels program is that it brought prices back to a sufficiency that reinvigorated investment in agriculture. And so at one level, I think a very good argument can be made that the biofuels uh, programs brought the world further from famine than it had ever been because of the price. So what we're left with is an issue of sizing. And agricultural is inherently an outdoor sport. And the great risk that we have is in both Western Europe with their mandates on biodiesel at 5.75 and in the US with bioethanol at 10%, is we have injected into the food system that has all of the disruptions in supply that come with being a weather impacted industry linked to inelastic demand mandates. And I think any economics text would tell you you're going to get outsized volatility if you have varying supplies by an externality like weather and you have mandated uh, demand. And so I think the issue is how do we get it sized right and how do we put in place those circuit breakers that help ensure that enough revenue is coming into global agriculture to reinforce reinvestment and at the same time prevent these outsized price volatility moves that disproportionately harm the world's poor. Thank you. Good answers. Questions? David? There is a, a mic coming. So I'm David Lobel from uh, the Program on Food Security. Uh, you, you both touched on climate change in the sense of it adding to stresses and, and sort of upping the stakes of, of the things you were talking about. Um, I, I guess I'm just wondering, other than making the work you do more important, is it having an impact right now on your strategies or should it be having an impact on your strategies and, and what specifically does it change about how you do business? Well, for us at the Gates Foundation, it certainly does shape our strategy and as an example, we have two significant projects uh, related to improving uh, stress tolerance or drought tolerance for crops. For example, our water efficient maize uh, project in Africa, WEMA, uh, and then also that we have a, another one which is called drought tolerant. Uh, and so trying to breed uh, crop varieties that will better withstand uh, water shortages or water stress drought we think is going to be extremely important. Some of the early results show that you can get as much as a 20% increase in, in yield or more under stress conditions when you have uh, varieties that are, are bred for that, um, uh, that need. And so that's just one example of how it's shaping our, our thinking. We're also looking at uh, uh, issues and, uh, and opportunities relative to irrigation because a lot of, of poor farmers are in areas that are rain fed, in particular sub-Saharan Africa. So that would be a second example of the type of ways in which it shapes our, our thinking about the, the challenge. In our case, we're afforded an opportunity that isn't available to an individual farmer in an individual uh, country, and that is diversification. And clearly, as you're going to have more uh, supply disruptions, it's important if we're going to be a reliable supplier to food customers around the world that we have as uh, broad-based an origination system as possible. And so our investments in more storage facilities, in faster operating port facilities, in doing that in more geographies has become more important than ever. So this year, we had enormous amounts of wheat that were trapped behind the embargoes in the Black Sea. And if we were going to continue to supply the flour millers in Egypt, we, on literally an overnight's notice, had to swing our whole supply chain and logistics to bring that wheat from the Canadian prairies, from Kansas and Oklahoma, and in some cases out, out of parts of Europe. 
And to do that, you have to have that footprint in place well ahead of the disruption as, as it emerges. So the big impact on our strategy has been to further highlight the importance of oversizing our capacity in each of the world's crop producing areas to be ready for the inevitable disruptions that will come. Some of them climate caused and others politically caused. Very good. Can I turn to this? Uh, yes. The, the, the light is such that, that you, I see faces out there, but I can't tell which faces. Mm -hmm. uh, and so please identify yourself. Thanks. I'm Tony Michaels, and it's been a wonderful yep. presentation. Um, you made a couple of great points, or a lot of great points, but a couple to focus on this, the importance of smallholder farmers and how the encouragement of that is going to be a big part of any strategy to alleviate poverty. And the final sense of something like Saudi Arabia not trying to grow wheat in the middle of the desert and, and doing it by buying land in Sudan. And there's in my perception, there's this great land grab going on by many of these countries that have an inability to grow their own food, uh, buying large tracts of land in Africa, China being one of them. Uh, can they ever be encouraged to get that smallholder hub and spoke kind of model that you talked about as a way that they can both you know, accomplish the goals they want and encourage the, the smallholder uh, uh, response that it's going to take to get rid of the poverty issue? I think for certain crops it absolutely can be done. I think the big challenge is in those crops where scale has outsized impacts on economics. So for instance, in cocoa, we've had great success working with smallholders because there's an enormous labor added component. If you're going to grow a row crop like corn, it, it takes a lot of really hard work and or quite high prices to offset uh, the scale economies that are available to row crops. So the answer is slightly different commodity by commodity. I think the Indonesian government's done a wonderful job of asking companies like ourselves to restrict the size of our plantations and to optimize uh, the number of smallholder, they call them plasma farmers, that surround each of the installations. And I think it takes, as so often is the case and so unfortunately the case, it takes good institutions to make good policy and to make them come alive. But my answer would be different for row crops than it would be for high value added, high labor added crops like coffee, like cocoa, and like palm. And I think you also, uh, I agree with Greg, and, and then, you know, from an, another perspective, you have the challenge of, of are the participants in those kinds of dealings well informed? I mean, in, in your, your business having, you know, good information is part of striking a good deal. And I think one of our concerns from the perspective of the foundation is that the pace at which the so-called land grab deals are going, we're not really sure that the, the, the countries who are making those, those deals are really thinking through how they should be structured. Uh, you also have the issues that, uh, land, that Greg alluded to earlier relative to, to land holdings. And since many of these countries you don't, you may not have property rights, um, uh, at least not as we culturally uh, are used to, then I think you run into some uh, uh, additional exacerbation on the rural sociology challenges. And so those are two issues that are on our mind relative to the so-called land grab deals. Greg, in Indonesia, where you have your oil palm, mm -hmm. is, is our property rights a, a, a severe problem around there? They certainly are in some parts of Indonesia. We, we have not confronted that challenge. Certainly, we have had boundary disputes, and the, the length That's of That might be a very small distinction there, yeah. yes. <laughs> from, from time to time, the length of different people's surveying chains is different <laughs> than others. But, but I think short of the kind of bad fences make bad neighbors issues, we haven't had big, big fundamental challenges. Another thing I would point out to good information the Indonesian government is fairly active in auditing the revenue of the marketing arm, which is Cargill, and to ensure that the fairness between the fruit price for the raw fruit received by the smallholder. And so our actual interaction is with a cooperative that represents those farmers in conjunction with the Ministry of Agriculture who helps monitor and audit uh, the price sharing. And so it does take some forethought and it takes some organization but it can be very effective. The other comment I would make, you could own all the land you wanted in Russia this year, it didn't help you. And, and, and so you have to be careful. I'm reminded of the joke about the New York motorist who was lost in Maine and he pulled into a gas station and he asked the guy in the gas station, does this road 
can I take this road to Bangor? He said, no, this road stays right here. <laughs> And, and, well, and, let me come to this side of the house. Uh, questions over here? Peter? Peter Timmer, I'm, I guess primarily interested in, in food price volatility, but I'm, I'm intrigued by the Cargill perspective on the trade-offs between, as it says, caloric sufficiency and rural sociology, and I'm wondering whether the Gates Foundation is listening to uh, the issues of those, those trade-offs. Uh, there was a fascinating interview with Bill Gates about a month ago in the Science Times, New York Times, uh, looking at five years of experience with the health uh, programs. And I think the bottom line was, gee, it's taking a lot longer than we thought. When you started in agriculture, it really seemed like you were in a hurry. Uh, the, this caloric sufficiency rural sociology trade-off says it may take a lot longer to get the kind of results that you want than you had hoped for in the beginning. I just wondered how, how you're going to deal with the longer time horizon that, that seems to me to be implied in this, this whole effort. Well, growing up in high tech probably distorts one's view uh, about uh, uh, the pace of economic change. So uh, I think that's a, that's a very fair point. Um, we, we are in these areas uh, for the, the long term. We have big aspirations. The big aspirations tend to push us. We like to, have, we like to operate with a sense of urgency. But we also know that, that things take a long time. We, we have an aspiration that you can significantly increase the agricultural productivity and thus the incomes of, of, of millions, if not hundreds of millions, of, of smallholder farmers over a 15-year period of time. Maybe it'll take 20 years. Maybe it'll take 25. But fortunately, the profile of the foundation uh, is to invest for the long term. And even though we were used to different pace of economic change in high tech, we were also always oriented towards investing for the long term. So fortunately, that's a principle that Melinda and Bill take, whether it's um, agricultural development or eradication of malaria, where our current prediction is that might take 40 years. I'm, I'm from the other side. I don't think there's a Moore's law for agriculture, but I do think that price is instructive. And I, I would make the wager that if you paid Ghanaian corn farmers $8 uh, a bushel, $30, $300 a ton for corn in five years, they would be a net exporter of corn. And I, I agree with that, especially if you get them connected to the market. Right. For yep. a lot of the, the poor farmers we work with, they're just not connected to the market. Right. And so uh, Greg's absolutely right for those that we can get connected to the market and hopefully right, we can come up with ways to get more farmers connected to the market. For a lot of the projects I referenced, cocoa, uh, coffee, uh, longer battle. we're trying to get them connected to the market. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Todd Chubrich. I'm an undergrad here. Um, the global rise in meat and dairy demand is substantially driven by the globalization of America's demonstrably unhealthy fast food culture, which developed in the context of a food industry that spends billions a year marketing meat, dairy, and processed foods to consumers, as well as significant government interventions favoring them, uh, among them corn subsidies, USDA dietary guidelines, and the federal school lunch program, policies all driven by the lobbying of agribusiness giants like Cargill. Preserving traditional food cultures with a more balanced intake of animal products and plants would go a long way to reducing the demand for meat and hence grain worldwide. So why have you seemingly excluded the role of food culture from your development paradigm? I'm always cautious when people read long questions. I'm not sure. <laughs> How do you feel, Greg? <laughs> I think it's an important question, and I think the role of, of protein in diets, uh, I think I mentioned in my comments that had spent time at Davos this year, and certainly most of the world's uh, NGOs are there. I found it interesting that the head of Oxfam pointed out the incredible response they see 
when people have modest amounts of animal protein added to their diets in birth weights, uh, in the wellness and health of lactating mothers. And they went through a long list uh, of issues, clearly at levels of animal protein far below those that are consumed in some, some of the Western countries. But I have watched, I lived in Asia for many years of the tiger miracles and, and watched uh, the average uh, family in Indonesia go from one chicken per year to one chicken per month. And to see the changes in the height of the school children, and you go to the schools that we support and see the eighth and ninth grade boys standing there, they're nearly a head taller than their parents. And I think the role of a balanced diet that contains both adequate caloric intake adamant, uh, and adequate protein, I think is fairly demonstrable to the issue about the promotion or the over-promotion of meat consumption. I, I think a, f a fair debate can be had that we've gone in some cultures too far, and particularly for certain lifestyles, that if we're not going to exercise, I happen to have a son who for many years was a college athlete. He managed to squeeze by on about 4,800 to 5,000 calories a day and had, had no body fat. And, uh, I think there's a trophy someplace from McDonald's that he that he has, and so <laughs> I think that I think that we need to to bear in mind the balance between calories in and calories out. As to the issue of the subsidization, certainly there was a long period, and it was captured in the charts, when the price paid by livestock producers in the United States was below the arguable full societal cost of raising those crops. Therefore, a subsidy. I think today we're on the opposite side of that, where the subsidization is for the production of biofuels, which makes the grain that's fed by America's livestock producers, the milk farmers out in the San Joaquin Valley, arguably somewhat higher than it would be in the, in the absence of that. And so I think in today's world, I do not see any particular government uh, subsidization or incentivization to the people that produce meat, rather the contrary. I'd like to just add, just from a perspective of traveling around the world, something that I didn't think was in your question that you might want to go back and, and think a little bit about. With the, looking at the period 2000 to 2050, the 50% increase in population, the projected 100% increase in demand for food, I think a lot has to do with, it, with uh, middle income country uh, diet shifts, in particular India and China, and I personally have not experienced that as being some significant export of American diet to those, to those, those countries. And so I think you're overlooking a little bit of that factor there, and you might consider how you think that those countries will develop their, their policies relative to, to health and nutrition. It, you raise a very important point. Mm -hmm. But I think uh, looking at what's happening in terms of India and China, in terms of their impact on, on uh, food, food demand, I think is a very interesting uh, topic. Good question. Yes. Hi, I'm Brooks Brown. I'm a, a recovering private equity guy who is now chairman of Windrock International. Um, it seems to me that, that your comments have abundantly proven that, that the risks are, are greater in farming, um, perhaps because um, uh, we do have all this volatility of prices and severe weather events that uh, lead to some of this. And I'm wondering, this is really a question for Jeff, um, a lot of traditional philanthropy has been, we'll focus on a project and um, we'll study it up front and we'll give X amount of money and see how that goes. And clearly, you know, some of the projects that you've talked about which were successful, the Uganda, the, the Kenya projects, in private equity we always think of something, of keeping some powder dry, um, particularly where events change, the externalities change. And I'm just wondering how that has affected the way you make grants. I'm just keeping our powder dry in the sense of being able to, uh, I mean, give me some examples of what you're thinking. I may well, not be. Well, I, I think at the design end up front, there's probably more need for walking around money by the project hmm. developers, for lack of a better word, um, to find the right producer groups to, to work with the women in Africa um, that are going to actually make the things happen. But also, um, as a project evolves and you've, you've dispersed some money to make it happen, and there, there's a twist. Um, mm -hmm. You decide that it needs something different. Uh, 
Yeah. A lot of traditional philanthropists would, would not necessarily do anything about that. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm wondering how it affects, um, there's a certain flexibility that is needed given the enhanced risks. And I'm wondering how that has changed your, your grant making. Well, there are two, there, it's not easy to do, uh, especially given the structure of the way in which philanthropy works, especially under U.S. laws and, and rules, you know, the requirement of a 5% or more payout, so on and so forth. And so you, 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 know, you deal with certain constraints, constraints that you don't deal with in other you know, cultures like the United Kingdom, the way in which philanthropy is, is regulated is, is different. So with those constraints in mind, I think there are two things that you, we have to do as philanthropists. One is trying to preserve a certain amount of flexibility within each project for those curveballs or twists and turns. As they, as they come up. And the structure typically is that you have a longer, we like to do longer term grants because we're trying to do long term investments, but you do that as you know, having you know, the basis of an annual report so that you can make adjustments along the way. I wouldn't want to oversell that though. It's not that easy to, because when somebody's trying to invest in something for the long term, they're putting in place people, infrastructure that you can't, uh, you know, you're not as agile as you'd like to be in terms of the dimension. The second thing is we always try and structure our portfolio so that each year we have a certain amount of new grant flexibility. In other words, we're not just, uh, you, you know, we're looking at the percentage of our payout that is tied up in uh, fulfilling the, the uh, um, annual payments on previous grants versus our new grant capacity. So those are the two dimensions on which you operate. You have to have enough new grant capacity to be able to undertake new ideas, and you have to, to try and preserve as much flexibility in these longer term grants, and that's not easy. Jeff, on the, on the agility question, mm -hmm. uh, how agile have you been in, in linking your health divisions with your agricultural divisions? Rural, rural health is a big issue, and I wonder that's usually a tough one in the countries themselves. Have you been able to make progress on that one? Yeah, two thoughts, two thoughts on that. One is uh, I think the Gates Foundation can be better at how we avoid the silos of health and, and agriculture and financial services of the poor, how we uh, avoid them being too siloed in a way that doesn't allow them to work together. One of our better examples, unfortunately, it happens to be the one, though, that is used the most because it's one of the only examples, uh, is our biofortification work. Our biofortification work, uh, just the, the short story is, is that we have uh, some fairly significant investment, um, I think in the range of $50 million, in breeding crops that will, or varieties that will have higher zinc, iron, vitamin A, et cetera. So if you wanna have long-term sustainable impact, getting the micronutrients into the crop itself is a, a great way to address those micronutrient deficiency issues. That was initiated by our global health group and is now managed by our agricultural group but in partnership with our, our nutrition, nutrition team. So, so we are trying to break down some of those silos. However, one of the things that I've been surprised by actually is the lack of really good research on the relationship of agriculture, food production, and nutrition. I, I, I have been surprised uh, by that. And we have decided in our nutrition area to primarily focus in on what are the approaches that we can do to improve nutrition for children up to the age of two, which frankly isn't as much as an agricultural uh, activity. We think that the primary thing that improves nutrition beyond that age is, is um, uh, better incomes, which come from, for, for poor farmers, it comes from improving their, their productivity. So point, the point I'm making is we think we have a lot to learn in this area. Ross? I'm Roz Naylor, and uh, it was two wonderful talks. Thank you so much. Uh, when you both talked, you talked about rural producers and the need to increase incomes, and I'm thinking about the net consumers in the situation, since so many people that actually own farms or live in rural areas are net consumers. And so 
how the price plays out. I'm, I'm wondering how you're thinking about that. And I assume it has to do with the um, creation of better markets regionally and, and locally. So I really want to know what you two talked about in Davos and how you're going to get <laughs> Cargill to create the supply chains in these smallholder situations. My takeaway of what a rural net consumer is is somebody who's a subsistence farmer and arguably not growing enough calories for his own family. Is that your definition? Sometimes there's better. It, that can be. And then sometimes there may be better opportunities uh, off, the, off the farm to earn some right. incomes and so right. forth. So. Right. So I, I think when it comes to true subsistence farming where there is not a price response because all of it's going to be consumed within the family unit, it becomes much more difficult. <laughs> I believe this, the straight fact is in the absence of those farm families having off-farm income, they will, by definition, not have the cash the following year to buy inputs to raise their productivity. And so the statistics that Jeff showed of low yields, one, one and a half tons per hectare, for a true subsistence farmer not responding to any market signals, the only way their productivity can be raised is through some form of income coming onto that farm, either through off-farm work, government grants, some form of subsidization. In the absence of that, the 60 million hectares of land in sub-Saharan Africa that's producing one, one and a half tons of, of grain per year will be locked in that doom loop of inadequate fresh cash resources to buy the inputs necessary to raise productivity. It, I think we're trying to figure out how we can take a portfolio approach. And by that, what I mean is that, uh, again, thinking about market failures and where catalytic philanthropy can fit in, we think there'll be an under uh, uh, a less than necessary amount of investment in productivity related to staple foods. We think there'll be more investment in cash income crops like cocoa and coffee, so on and so forth. So part of the role that we want to play is to ensure that there's enough investment in improving the productivity of, of staple foods, whether it's cassava or, or uh, other types of, uh, you know, cow peas, chickpeas, et cetera, uh, as part of their, um, their, their diets. And, and so hopefully what can happen is, is that we can have better, better varieties, better farm management practices associated with those, those crops that then give those farm families the opportunity for other income sources, just as Greg described. And so, so we are, are going to continue our investment in the cash income crops, but also try and make sure that we have an adequate amount of investment that will, will help the world improve the productivity of the, the, the staple crops. And so that's what I mean by a portfolio approach. Yes. Hi, uh, Steve Stedman from FSI. Um, I was just looking at the, the list that, that Greg put up here, um, the keys to increasing food security. And on every one of these, I see governance, right? That, you know, trade-offs between caloric sufficiency and rural sociology, policy choices probably should meet, be made by governments. Honor comparative advantage, policy, governance question. Clarify property rights, governance. Provide smallholders revenue certainty. Get the price right, governance. Enable open markets, governance, and a lot of other things. Private and public sectors working together, partially governance. So I guess, so my question is to Jeff, given this list that Greg has put up about keys to increasing food security, um, does the foundation do any funding on basic questions of the governance of food security, let's say in Africa, and if not, why not? It sounds like you must work on governance. <laughs> you know. Me, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If the world is a nail, everybody's a hammer. Um, the we we do in a small way. I don't want to oversell what we what what we do. Um, the. I mean, frankly, part of why we're making the investment in this symposium is to bring people together who we think can be leaders in shaping the ideas of what will be effective uh, policy approaches, what will be effective economic environments in the countries that, that we care a lot about, in particular Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And so 
what we try and do is we try and make sure that we're building the base of information and evidence that will lead people to make good decisions. Uh, and that is a specific pillar. It's one of the four pillars of our, of our agricultural strategy. So that's an example of, of where some of our work touches on, on governance. Second, second thing I'll say is that we are, we are trying to develop our capacity to, to work with governments. For example, we have quite an intensive project underway right now with the government of Ethiopia. Uh, Prime Minister uh, Melis Zanawi approached Melinda uh, about two years ago, asked us to get involved in assessing their agricultural extension system. They liked our, our work, so then they said, well, they'd like us to get involved in shaping uh, the agricultural policy and research and development uh, sector in, in Ethiopia, and so we've now gotten involved with a series of recommendations there. So that's a second example of where we are trying to develop our own capacity to be able to play a constructive catalytic role uh, with governments. There's a set of governance issues that are broader than just you know what goes on in, in agriculture, and that's the area I wouldn't want to oversell. We do a little bit on property rights. But let me just say that one of the principles we have at the foundation is focus. Um, we think that if we try and do too many things, we will, we will fail. And so we will look to other institutions and hopefully good partnerships with other institutions who have greater expertise, greater capacity in the broader aspects of, of governance than, than we do. And we're always looking for ideas of who those partners should be. Let me push you both a little bit harder on the governance question. At least, at least a third of the people who are food insecure are in countries that by any standard are badly governed. And it's tough for the private sector, and I think it's tough for the public sector, and it's tough for the foundation. How, how, I'm not clear how either of you get a foothold in, in those countries, some of which are desperately poor and need a lot of help. And maybe the answer is you can't do it. No, I, I think you can. Clearly, the environment can be so hostile to commerce that, that it really is almost impossible to proceed. But I, I would draw two neighboring uh, countries as, as a good example. If you look at the food production statistics in Mozambique, and clearly they had enormous problems during the time that their food production imploded. And the government hasn't come back to the standard that probably their citizens want or anyone would hope they'd finally reach. But just with modest improvements of, <clears throat> in, of encouragement that allow people to come in, we've seen dramatic increases. Across the border in, in Zimbabwe, for a long time after you could argue they had relatively difficult governance, production held together. Farmers are a resilient lot. And as long as sufficient revenue was flowing into those businesses, they persisted. But ultimately, the governance became so hostile to commerce that it finally just dropped very quickly. And so back to the issue of how fast a country like Ghana could feed itself, I think you just need reasonable governance. You don't necessarily need each and every one of these uh, to be in place, but you need to be sure that it is not so hostile to commerce that it's impossible for honorable people uh, to make any progress. I don't expect the government of the Ivory Coast to be offering agricultural extension services anytime soon. <laughs> and so we can do that as long as the environment is reasonable and not hostile, that we can get our crops to the port and that we can that we can bring them to market and bring revenue back to the country, we can afford to hire the agronomists to buy the motorcycles and the Jeeps to get out and, and go to these villages and do the training programs that are permitted by the grant that we have from the Gates Foundation. So we can reach 200,000 farmers. We just need the government not so much to endorse it as to stay out of the way of it and allow those farmers to re receive a fair portion of the price. So I agree, every one of those has a governance component to it. It need not be perfection. It just needs not to be hostile. To, to some extent, our approach can insulate us from individual country challenges. Uh, I'll give you a different example uh, from our global health work that I think more clearly illustrates our approach. But 
you know, we work a lot on trying to uh, get better developing world vaccines available, like pneumococcal vaccine, uh, which obviously defends against pneumonia, uh, and also uh, rotavirus vaccine, which uh, defends against uh, uh, diarrhea. And in, you know, we have rotavirus in this country, but in those countries, it kills kids. It doesn't in our, in our, in our country. So if we can get the prices, if we can get the advances, scientific advances in those vaccines funded and done, and if we can get them, if we can get the prices down, then that is kind of, you might think of as a horizontal intervention that is broadly available to a large number of countries. And some of the countries may have a bad governance environment, which governance environments, which causes them not to get their kids vaccinated, but there'll be a bunch of other countries that will. will. So since we're putting a lot into those kinds of, uh, of investments, and that's the general approach of the, of the Gates Foundation, and it includes our work in agriculture. We're investing in a lot of science and technology that will help uh, agriculture as it relates to dairy farming or cocoa farming or cashew farming or even cassava. And there may be certain countries that for a given period of time won't have the uptake or adoption of those because of their issues, but there'll be a number of others. And so we can, we can kind of have our portfolio, if you will. The other thing that we do is we're trying to develop more uh, on the ground capacity in those parts of the world, the organizational capacity. So for example, our work with, the, with AGRA, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, led by Africans in Africa, you know, so the, they can take advantage of some of these, these, these scientific and technological advances uh, in the countries uh, where the environment exists to take advantage of them. And so our approach al allows us to insulate ourselves uh, a little bit from an individual country's uh, governance issue, but not completely. Well, I think the time has come this is a discussion that could and probably should go on for a very long time. But I think uh, we should adjourn formally. I now want you to join with me in thanking Greg and Jeff for great presentations and a wonderful Q&A. Thank you so much. <laughs>